Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning at uh, Forge Road Bible Chapel for our Family Bible Hour. We welcome the Christians from Brooklyn Bible Chapel, from Antioch Bible Chapel, or, or, or from Antioch Baptist Church, and any guests and friends. And uh, maybe you cannot see me this morning, or maybe you can't see the slides. We'll be recording this and posting it on the website. And actually, whether you can see me or not, that's okay. The man who uh, taught me to speak told me only about uh, a thousand times that nobody comes to see the speaker anyway. People don't come to see the speaker, they come to see the Lord. And I remember that every time I get an opportunity to talk with you. Now we have a lot of work to do today. We're continuing our series in the book of Philippians. This morning we're going to be considering chapter 3. We are taking things slightly out of order as the schedule was originally put together. Matt Gorman was to have this week uh, in the latter part of Philippians chapter two, but due to the pandemic, he had to change his, he had a change in his duty schedule. And so today will be chapter three and Matt will have the meeting with us next week. Now, last Sunday, Bill Dunkerton gave us a shorthand way of remembering the key points for this series and this book. Week one was a background from Paul's second missionary journey when he reached Philippi. And in a word, it, the message was to be ambassadors. Then Paul Dumb's message in chapter one that we would be partners in grace. In week three, it was be worthy. And last week, it was to be united. So today's be, to borrow on Bill's idea, is in chapter three, which is to be mature. Paul writes in chapter 3, verse 15, therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Most often when we talk about Christian maturity, we focus on the individual, growing and striving for, Christian, for individual maturity in Christ, and so we will do today. But Philippians is more than that. It's more than just individual and personal maturity. It includes the maturity of a church. And we're going to see the same principles apply. And just as we strive individually towards the image of the Son of God in our lives, so we do as a church. So if you have your Bibles, open them to Philippians chapter 3. I'll have the uh, scripture on the screen here for those who can, uh, you know, for those who can see it, as Paul writes in, uh, in another place, that speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head that is Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working which every part in which every part does its share, causes growth in the body, for the edifying of itself in love. Now this morning, I uh, not only have the advantage of following the messages brought by Norris Gorman and Paul Dumb and Bill Dunkerton, but the added advantage of a message given by Joshua Gorman on February 23 at the chapel. You might remember when we used to meet at the chapel, it seems like a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away when Joshua gave an, an excellent word on this same subject of Christian maturity. He spoke from 1 Corinthians, but he referenced our chapter in Philippians 3. And all of that lays a good foundation for what we're going to talk about today. And in particular, we're going to consider four aspects of maturity that the Apostle Paul writes here. And if we can take these four points and have this mind to renew and refresh ourselves, then we will have done well. First, to rejoice in the Lord. Second, to know Jesus Christ and then know him better. We just heard a song about that. To know Christ and then know him better. Third, to press towards the goal. And fourth, to live as citizens of heaven. So look for those points as we read together through Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. 
Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Although though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or that I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold on that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold on me. Brethren, I do not count myself as having apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the, degree, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us as a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, it, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it, we, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things, even to himself. May the Lord bless our time together as we consider his word. Now, part one is to rejoice in the Lord. And the first word in this chapter three is the word finally. Now, as you read Paul's letters, one of the things that you'll notice is that he often has a hard time finishing them. He was so engaged in the lives he was of the people he was writing to. His heart was so full. I think he enjoys the fellowship that he has through writing them so much that he, it's like he doesn't want to sign off and say goodbye. That's what we have here. This is what we call chapter one or chapter three, verse one. We're halfway through the book and he writes, finally, last point, wrap it up. Except that as he's coming in for a landing, all of a sudden, he takes off again. And uh, maybe you know some speakers like that. If you look ahead to, uh, you look ahead 28 verses to chapter 4, verse 8, he gets, he gets back to the word, finally. Now, what Paul says, finally, is to rejoice in the Lord. Then notice what he writes next. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious. And then just to prove a point, he says it again two verses later, rejoice in Jesus Christ. To rejoice in the Lord is something that Paul told Christians over and over and over again. So much so that he actually says here, I know I say this a lot. And some of you may think this is tedious, but in case you missed it, rejoice in the Lord. In Philippians, 
Paul writes that he has rejoiced in the Lord greatly. That's in chapter 4, verse 10. And that I will rejoice, yes, and will rejoice in chapter 1, verse 18. He rejoices with them all in 2.17. They rejoice with him in 2.18. They will rejoice in the day of Christ in 2.16. Their rejoicing will be more abundant in 1.26. He says rejoice in the Lord here in 3.1. And then he says it twice in one verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. That's in 4.4. In four chapters, he tells them to rejoice in the Lord nine different times. Okay. Rejoice in the Lord. We got it. And then again, maybe we don't. To rejoice in the Lord is not some pithy Christian speak cliche. It's not like keep a sunny disposition or count your blessings or always look on the bright side of life. Look what he says about it. He says, for you, it is safe. Now, that's a question that people are asking a lot right now. Where is it safe? The people at my law office ask it or kind of hint at it. Is our office safe? Is my job safe? Is my 401k investment for retirement safe? Are my children safe? Will Ford Road be safe when we reopen? Paul, of course, is not talking about physical or financial safety. The last time you and I were together, we talked about just how unsafe his ministry was. He's telling the Christians how to be spiritually safe. To rejoice in the Lord is a safeguard. It's a precaution. It's a protection. And Paul is going to tell them that over and over and over again until it's second nature. Every day I come home from work. I walk in the door, I say, hi, I'm home. And the first thing my wife, Vicki, says to me is, go wash your hands. That's nice, dear. How was your day? Go wash your hands. I, I wash my hands at the office before I left. Go wash your hands. Uh, we go out for a walk. We live in the city. We go to the uh, CVS drugstore. You know, it's always open. There's not a line to get in. And so we go in there to browse. And uh, we get back home, we walk in the door, Vicki says, go wash your hands. There's something out there. It is pervasive, it is ubiquitous, it is contagious. It is so small you cannot see it, but so powerful it can shut down the nation. Do not think you are immune from it, go wash your hands. That's the way Paul tells them to rejoice in the Lord. Sin is out there. It is pervasive. It is ubiquitous. It is contagious. It is so small you cannot see it. It is so powerful it can sway the nations. Do not think you're immune from it. Consciously, intentionally rejoice in the Lord. Look at the next verse. Three times he says it. Beware, beware, beware. So be safe. And the safest place you can go, the safest thing you can do, is to rejoice in the Lord. This book was written during the most difficult trial that Paul faced during his ministry. We talked about that last time, about how he was burdened above measure and beyond strength. He needed a place to be safe spiritually. And so he rejoiced in the Lord. In the book of Nehemiah is a famous verse. We sang it this morning, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah said that when the captives of Israel had returned from exile and they heard the law read for the first time and they realized that they were far, far away from God. And Nehemiah said, don't sorrow. Repentance is a cause to rejoice. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now that verse does not mean that the joy of the Lord makes you strong like eating your Wheaties. Now if you can see a screen, you're going to see a diagram of the Hebrew word as it's translated throughout the Old Testament. This diagram, by the way, is pulled from Logos Bible Software. And the different ways that this word has been translated. The joy of the Lord is your fortress. The joy of the Lord is your refuge. The joy of the Lord is your strong place. The joy of the Lord is your mountain stronghold. In a dangerous world, the joy of the Lord is where you will be safe. There's a ridiculous stereotype that 
great Christians live sad, lonely, monkish, deprived lives. Christians live great lives. Jesus said he came to give us life, an abundant life, life that abounds in joy, in purpose, in satisfaction, in fulfillment, lives that can handle whatever the world throws at us, including, including pandemics, and responds rejoicing. Mature Christians are not drenched in self-pity. They don't bemoan the current state of things. They're not withdrawn from the world. They're not afraid of tomorrow. They set their minds on the Lord and rejoice every day by self-discipline if necessary, by second nature when it comes. Now what Paul is telling them specifically to be aware of are those who turn the gospel into religion. And in his day, this, that was those who claimed that Gentile believers had to be circumcised, or as Paul put it in that verse, submit to mutilation. Tact was never one of Paul's primary attributes. Now, today religion is more sophisticated and it takes a number of forms. Let me tell you two things about religion. First, it turns the salvation in Jesus Christ from worshiping God in the spirit into obligations of the flesh, stuff you have to do. And second, it sucks the joy right out of the gospel. By the nature of my work, I have represented many Christian organizations, mostly Christian, but not all. I have been in a vast array of religious services, again, mostly Christian, but not all. All of them have the absolute constitutional right to the freedom of religion and of worship and of conscience, and all of them are worthy of respect. But having said that, let me tell you about religion. Religion centers on you rather than on the Lord. There is no joy out there in religion land. There is obligation, there is ceremony, there is prostration, there are nonsense promises, there are endless appeals for money. I have been in places where I think they just opened the sprinkler system and rained guilt down on everybody. To realize the joy of the Lord and the joy of the gospel is to be on the road to maturity. I'm concerned for, and I pray for Christians when it seems like they might be losing that joy. David prayed, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. There is nothing better in all the world than being a Christian with your sins forgiven, your mind enlightened, and your spirit redeemed. The joy of the Lord is a safe place to be. So rejoice in the Lord and go wash your hands. Part two, of our to part two of our message, the second point of maturity, is to know Jesus Christ and then to know him better. As Paul talks about those who change the gospel into religion, he reminds the Philippians and us that if there was anybody who did the religious stuff and checked all the boxes, he was at the top of the list. He talked about his lineage, but being born of really good parents is a credit to them. It's not really a credit to me. Paul talks about his circumcision, about his education, about keeping the law. And then in verse 8, he said that all of that is rubbish. At least according to the King James translators, it's rubbish, which is a very polite translation of what Paul said, as actually... As I noted before, tact was never Paul's strong suit. And if, in, if instead of the word rubbish, I were to hear, I would hear use the word from our current vernacular that most closely approximates Paul's meaning, well, let's just say that my mother would be very unhappy with me. Paul says that none of those degrees, those accomplishments, those accolades are worth anything compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. First of all, it is through faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved, that we become righteous in God's sight. Now, you might have noticed as we read these few verses that Paul mentions three different kinds of righteousness. He talks in verse 9 about my own righteousness, what we call self righteousness. You know what that is. 
people who think they're better than others. You declaring yourself, deciding that you yourself are good and right and worthy. We, we all know people like that. But then in verse 6, he also talks about a righteousness which is of the law. Doing the stuff, following the rules, checking the boxes. Paul says, I did that better than anybody. But neither of those, neither self-righteousness nor legal righteousness, is what gets you saved or what passes you from death unto life. Neither of those count anything in God's eyes. God's righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not something that you have inherently. It is imparted unto you by God. It is not something that you earn. It is through your faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God does not come from anywhere else but faith in Jesus Christ. And if you think that it does, then respectfully, you're just exercising self-righteousness. You're deciding that it's you who determine the rules. It, it, what matters is just what you think. But then Paul goes on from knowing what Jesus Christ did and from knowing who Jesus Christ is to knowing him. Faith goes beyond a confidence in what the Lord will do. And it reaches to a confidence in the Lord himself. In the New Testament, there are 11 Greek words that are translated to know. They cover the spectrum of how we use the word. Hey, uh, you, you know, there are people that you know, uh, meaning that you met. Do you know uh, so-and-so? Sure, I've met so-and-so. I, I, I met him, uh, what was that, that community function uh, 18 months ago? Oh, yeah, oh, no, sure, 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 I know him. Well, there are people that you know, and then there are people that you know. Here, Paul is using the most personal, the most intimate of those 11 words the word he uses when he talks about Timothy in chapter 2, we'll hear about that next week. You know this guy, he says. You know his character. You know his work. Paul says, I know him like a father knows his son. Paul says concerning Jesus Christ, I just don't want to, I don't want to know just about him. I want to know him. I want to have fellowship with him and share experiences with him and be like him and one day be with him. The better you know Jesus Christ, the more mature a Christian you are going to be. The better you understand his character, the closer you are to his purposes, the more mature will, will be your Christian life. The better we know Jesus Christ as a church, the more mature we will be as a group of Christians. So how do you do that? How do we do that? Well. Those people that you really know, how did you get to really know them? Well, by spending time with them, by working together with them. That's just what Paul says here. Fellowship in sufferings, fellowship in resurrections, in, in his resurrection. Make time in your life for Jesus Christ. Make time in your life for what Jesus Christ thinks is important. This is why, as a church, we set aside a time to consider him every Sunday in the breaking of bread. Not to consider the doctrine, not to consider the needs, but to consider him. Ask the Lord, through the Spirit, to know him better, to understand better, to open your mind to Scripture, to open your heart in prayer, to open your life in service. And then watch what happens. Part three, the third point in being a, 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 in maturity is to press towards the goal. I press toward the goal for the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The 1958 Green Bay Packers ended their season with a record of one win 10 losses and one tie, which needless to say was the worst record in the National Football League that year. 
They were last in the league in points scored. They were last in points allowed, meaning that they had both the worst offense and the worst defense. They lost to your Baltimore Colts by a score of 56 to nothing. When I looked at the box, or I looked at the box score of that game, and, it, it, and honestly, the game wasn't that close. Then the Packers completely botched the number one draft choice. You know, if you, if you finish last, you get, the, you get the first choice in the draft. Well, they selected somebody named Hurst Randolph Duncan as their first pick. Now, there's a name that just says football to you, right? Hurst Randolph Duncan. Well, Hurst Randolph Duncan learned he was drafted by the Packers and immediately signed with the British Columbia Lions of the Canadian Football League. The franchise was in free fall and its very existence was in question. On February 2nd, 1959, the Packers hired a guy named Vince Lombardi as their new head coach. Lombardi assembled his last place last in offense, last in defense, last in the eyes of their countrymen team for his first meeting. And at his first meeting, he said this, gentlemen, we will chase perfection. And we will chase it relentlessly, knowing all the while that we can never attain it. But along the way, we shall catch excellence. And you might know the rest of the story. Five championships in seven years, the only team in the modern NFL history to do a three-peat. When I was a boy, I read the book Instant Replay. Uh, Jerry Kramer played a right guard for those championship Packer teams, and the Instant Replay was his diary, the 1967-68 Packers season. I read that book like 10 times. And Kramer talked about how Lombardi would quote scripture and he would make it sound like all the apostles and prophets were really football coaches. I don't know about that, but this Lombardi quote sounds like it's right out of Philippians 3. Not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold on that for which Jesus Christ has also laid hold on me. Brethren, I don't count myself as having apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind, reaching forward to the things that are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Consider those words that I may lay hold on that for which Jesus Christ also laid hold on me. When there was nothing at all good that could be said about me except some of that check the boxes stuff. One day God in Jesus Christ laid hold of me. And when he did, he had a purpose. He had a goal. We read about that back in chapter one, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The good work of God in me began on the day that I was saved through faith in Jesus Christ and was born again. And I trust the same is true for you. But it did not end there. And it won't end until the day of Christ Jesus when everything that God intended for me and for you will come to be. Paul says, I'm not there yet. I'm not as God desires me to be, but I have that goal before me. And though in this life I will never attain it, still I'm going to reach for it and I'm going to strive for it. And when I fall and when I fail and when I disappoint and when things go wrong, well, I'm going to put that behind me. I'm going to forget the things that are behind. I'm going to reach forward anew. I'm going to press again towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus and striving towards that upward call of Christ Jesus. I just may catch excellence. That's what Paul says in chapter one, that we may approve what is excellent. I commend to you Joshua Gorman's message from February. I went back, I listened to it again in preparation for today. He quoted, uh, the wor he quoted words from this chapter in Philippians. He talked about distractions or just laziness as obstacles to overcome on the road to maturity. He talked about when he realized that it was time to grow up. This is a personal decision. 
that each one of us has to make for himself or herself. How important is it to know Jesus Christ? How important are the purposes of God in Jesus Christ? Some of us may feel closest to him in songs of joy and worship. Others may feel they know him best in service. Other, others in quiet times of prayer. Others may feel his power in their, in, in their study, striving to understand. These verses are compelling not only to us individually, but also to us as a church. A church matures just as a person. The whole body we read from Ephesians, knit and jo joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, but what by with every part doing its share, by which we grow up in all things for edification in love. The Philippians were a strong church, a mature church, to whom Paul could write such things. And I like to think that we together, you and me, we can be like them and be as Paul describes in that letter. That with our eyes confidently focused on the things of Jesus Christ, living our Christian lives together without distraction or laziness or complacency, we would pursue that for which God laid hold of us and pursue it relentlessly, knowing that on this side of eternity, we're never going to achieve it. But in the course of so doing, that we would together abound more and more, be growing always in knowledge as people that know the Bible and really know it. That together we would more and more abound in discernment, not confused or uncertain, but walking in the wisdom that the Holy Spirit gives. That together we would be sincere and without offense, living blameless lives before the world, commending ourselves to every man's conscience, that we would together more and more be filled with the fruits of righteousness, manifesting the good things of the Spirit of God within us, seeing the fruit of our work around us, all of which is by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. And then our part four is to be citizens. Of heaven. Chapter 3, verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly await the Savior. Now, we started this series in Acts 16, where one of the first things we learned about Philippi was that it was a colony. Acts 16, 12 says that Paul, that Paul and uh, Silas from there went to Philippi, which is the foremost city in that part of Macedonia, a colony. Now, geographically, Philippi is very important with the mountains on one side and the marshes running down to the sea on the other. It was described by ancient historians as the gateway from Europe to Asia. This was the place where uh, the armies of Mark Anthony and Octavian uh, defeated the armies of Brutus and Cassius in 42 BC, effectively ending the Roman Republic. And all of you who are fans of Shakespeare, and you all know who you are, will immediately make the connection with the tragedy of Julius Caesar, Act 4, Scene 3, where the ghost of Caesar appears to Brutus to foretell his death in Philippi. And that's on the screen if you have opportunity to see it. The place was so important that Anthony left a large company of Roman soldiers, loyal Roman soldiers there, to secure that narrow passageway, that gateway. And in 27 BC, it was formally made a colony of Rome. Philippi was in Macedonia, but it was governed by Roman law. It was populated by Roman citizens, just like Maryland was originally a British colony and was populated by British citizens and lived under British law and one day would fight a, a revolution to preserve the rights of Englishmen, even though it was across the Atlantic in North America. This is from, um, uh, there's a verse up from Acts chapter 16, uh, what we looked at when Norris had the message, verses 20 and 21, where they brought, they brought Paul and Silas to the magistrates and they said, these men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city 
and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or, or observe. You see there, they were Romans living in Macedonia. The colony was in Macedonia, their citizenship was in Rome. And so in this letter, Paul picks up and uses that idea. He says to the Christians at Philippi, you're like a colony. You're a colony of heaven. You and I were not in heaven, but our citizenship is heavenly. We live by the laws that govern heaven. Our customs and our usage are heavenly. Our speech should be heavenly. And we live in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which we will know in heaven as we wait for his return. And so we live here on earth as a colony of heaven. Finally, and I'm going to promise you that this is finally, we're going to look back at chapter 1, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 15, which is the verse we started with. Therefore, let many, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Now, personally, I think Paul has a lot of guts to say here, if you're not sure how to do this, watch me. Follow my example. And I kind of wish he'd just stop there. But he doesn't say, just watch me. He says, watch us. Note those who so walk. Throughout my life, I have been blessed, instructed, exhorted, corrected, and most of all, inspired by men who for me were, and men who today for me are, examples who I aspire to be like. I encourage you, regardless of your experience in the Lord, to find such men and such women who are more mature, who have better attained, and to note their example, to listen to them talk, to watch how they work, to see how they live. If it is hard for you to watch Christ, or if you don't understand what that means, then watch them. And that necessitates that there be a them to be watched. There has to be those who so walk to be that pattern. You and I, we have to have our eyes on Christ because other people have their eyes on us. And maybe the best thing about what Paul is explaining here is that we cannot achieve it. It is a lifelong process, a lifelong adventure of continued growth. But Paul writes this word of encouragement. Live to the full degree of, a, of maturity that you have attained. Don't live as less than yourself. Don't live as less than what you can be. The Spirit of the Lord will reveal more to you. And then more yet. Don't worry about the things that are behind you. Don't worry about trying but falling short. Because ultimately... This process is the work of the Spirit of God, and he who began a good work will complete it in you and me until the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to me this morning. May the Lord bless the walk of each one, and let us press together towards the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless you each one. And thank you, Tom, for that word of encouragement. Uh, let's look to the Lord as we close our meeting. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that in him we have all things. Lord, and even in these times, we thank you that in him we have safety, uh, and, and that that safety comes from our rejoicing in him. Lord, to help us to not be discouraged. Help us to not be downcast. Help us to remember always to rejoice in him and to know him and to know him better and better even as we've heard in this beautiful song, to know the Lord and to press on, Lord, that we would press on to 
to the excellence of God that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Lord, that we would, would recognize where our citizenship is, that it's in heaven, and that this place that can be dark and can be difficult um, is just a temporary home. Lord, we thank you that our hope is in him. And we ask that today our prayer, even as Paul says, that it, it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes from Christ to the praise and glory of God. In the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to seeing you again next week.